A very good morning to all the CLAT aspirants who are aiming to crack the CLAT in the year 2020. I welcome you to the third edition of CLAT Funda series hosted by Institute of Law, Nirma University. This week's tips on preparation is in continuation with what had been done in the last two weeks. For those of you who heard me, it would be very easy for you to attempt the reading comprehension. And for those who have not heard the first two videos, I shall give a quick recap. Then we shall move on to solving one of the reading comprehensions that had come in the CLAT 2019 paper and apply the tips we have learned to solve the comprehension. What you see in front of you is I've divided the reading comprehension in essentially two parts. The first is a fact-based approach and the second is an opinion-based approach. When I talk about a fact-based approach, it essentially means that a reading comprehension is based on some facts, some pre-existing facts, uh, where you have no opinion of the author. When I talk about an opinion-based approach, it basically means that it is an opinionated passage wherein the author would have added his opinions to the existing situation or his existing facts. Fact-based approach is further divided into two parts. The first is the narrative and the second is the descriptive. Talking about what is a narrative passage is basically nothing but a narration of a story. Whenever you see a reading comprehension that is telling a story or is a story-like uh, passage, it becomes a narrative passage. Of course, it has to be based on some existing facts. When I talk about a descriptive kind of a passage, I will explain it with the help of an example which I used in the first video as well. For example, if somebody asks you, could you describe Mumbai? What are you going to possibly say in the passage? You will say that Bombay has been is divided into two parts. One is the town area, one is the suburbs. So what you're trying to do is you're merely describing what is the existing fact. You're not making an opinion of yours. You're not adding any opinion of yours. All you're doing is you're merely stating what Mumbai is into the passage. So that essentially becomes a descriptive kind of a passage. Opinion-based approach is essentially divided into three. First is the argumentative, the second is the analytical, and third is the abstract. When I talk about argumentative, argumentative approach is a one-sided approach in which the author is going to give his perspective towards a certain phenomenon. He is either going to give his perspective in support of that phenomenon or he is going to give his perspective on, as against the phenomenon. But it is only going to be a one-sided approach. And when I talk about an analytical type of an approach, it basically means that the author is going to analyze the pros and the cons of a certain concept and he's going to have a neutral approach and then he is going to eventually conclude right so in analytical you are going to be uh, balancing out the pros and the cons of a certain phenomenon and then you're going to conclude the paragraph let me give you an example of the analytical type of a passage for instance if i say that the lifting of the ban by the government is it good or is it bad so if i say as an author that these are the pros of you know lifting the ban and these are cons of lifting the ban. In that situation, and then eventually I come down to the conclusion of whether the pros outweigh the cons or not, and then I conclude. It automatically means that my passage is an analytical type of a passage. However, where, where instead, I just say that lifting of the ban is not good for the Indian economy. Automatically, what is going to happen? It is going to come under the argumentative side of the passage because I'm just giving one side of the argument saying that the lifting of the ban might not be good for the economy or might not be good for the population or might not be good for the country, right? And when I talk about abstract, anything that doesn't fall either under analytical or argumentative automatically falls under abstract. You can also see my first video in order to understand abstract better. About what are the three steps which you have to have in order to crack the reading comprehension. The first step is that you have to read the passage. When I say read the passage, like I told you in my earlier paragraph, uh, earlier video, that read the passage does not mean skim through the passage. When I say read the passage, you have to understand the passage. The second point that you have to remember, the second step is find the central theme. Now, it is very important while you're reading the passage that you try and understand that what is the central theme that the author is trying to communicate through that passage. 
I remember in the first video I had given an example or for example I say that the public officials have been eating a lot of money or they have been uh, siphoning away funds all the central theme that you know you can gauge from the entire from the reading of the entire paragraph is that it is talking about something related to corruption so when you're reading the passage what you have to do is develop in your mind that what the author is trying to communicate the central theme of the paragraph the third step that you have to remember is form a summary so when you're reading the paragraph, there needs to be a summary that needs to be formed simultaneously in your mind in which you need to know that this is what the paragraph is speaking about, which led to this and this eventually led to this. Now, why this will be helpful is even if there is a question that relates directly to locating something in the paragraph and you have formed a summary, you exactly know where to look at. Remember, these tips are important because you have to save on time. Had it been a situation where you had all the time to attempt a question, it would not have been possibly very helpful. But where you, be, where you have limited time, all these tips are going to be very, very important because you will not have time to reread the paragraph over and over again in order to find your answer. If you already know, if you've already figured these three things out, it will be very easy for you to attempt the questions at, in a very limited time period. Right? Now, moving ahead. Now that we have understood all the three steps, what you have in front of you is a reading comprehension from the 2019 CLAT paper. What we are going to do is we are going to read this comprehension together in order to see all whether we are able to whether we are able to inculcate all the three steps while we are reading and then we are going to eventually attempt the questions. Remember one thing. Uh, you can because I'm doing it with you here we might take some time but I would suggest everyone to do it themselves and also see how much time are they taking in order to solve one question that will really help you in timing your paper and timing your questions as well the words invention and innovation are closely linked but they're not interchangeable the inventor is a genius who uses his intellect, imagination, time and resources to create something that does not exist. But this invention may or may not be of utility to the masses. It is the enterprising innovator who uses various resources, skills and time to make the invention available for use. The innovator might use the invention as it is modify it or even blend two or more inv inventions to make one marketable product. A great example is that of the iPhone, which is a combination of various inventions. If an invention is a result of countless trials and errors, so can be the case with an innovation. Not every attempt to make an invention is successful. Not every innovation sees the light of the day. Benjamin Franklin had the belief that success doesn't come without challenge mistake and in a few cases failure. I'm going to stop here before we move on further in the paragraph. What is that one thing that you can simply understand when you read the first paragraph of your reading comprehension? That what the author is trying to say is that it is trying to differentiate between two concepts. One is the invention and second is the innovation. And that is what forms the central theme of your passage. So that means from the very first paragraph that I read, I realize that the entire base of the reading comprehension is that the author is trying to tell us that there is a difference between two concepts, invention and innovation. Now, another thing which is very, very, so the first thing is I'm reading the comprehension and I'm understanding what he's trying to say. The second step was to find the central idea. When I read the first paragraph itself, it becomes extremely clear to me right here that what the paragraph is going to be talking about is it is going to differentiate between the two concepts that is invention and innovation. Now very very important was the third step was the formation of the summary. So I've already started forming a summary in my mind. One more thing that I told you in my first video was the five type of questions that are most necessarily asked in the reading comprehension. And the first kind of question is the what is the what kind of reading comprehension is it? Now, when you see the first paragraph, what do you think is the kind of passage, whether it is a fact-based passage or whether it is an opinion-based passage? It is very clear from reading the first paragraph that what the author is trying to do is merely telling you what the situation and what the facts are about invention and innovation. 
not anywhere in the passage in the first paragraph am i able to understand or am i am i able to gauge that he is trying to give an opinion of her, of his on what is an invention and what is an innovation it is merely telling us that this is invention this is innovation and these two things are separate so that means my passage is a fact based passage whether it is narrative descriptive we are going to come down and we are going to try and understand but it is very clear that opinion based passage is out of question it is it is it falls under the fact based passage right i hope you are able to understand this now let's move ahead one of the world's most famous innovators steve jobs says sometimes when you innovate you make mistakes it is best to admit them quickly and get on with improving your other innovations thus inventors and innovators have to be intrepid enough to take risks I'm going to stop here for a moment because I suddenly realized that we've been using very normal words. However, there's this one word which we don't use as normally while we are talking or while we are speaking, and that word is intrepid. So I'm going to try and understand what does this word mean mean in this context. Now, remember one thing that you would have probably tried and understood in the second video is that every word has two meanings. One is the literal meaning, and the other is a contextual meaning usually the contextual meanings are time bound however let's try and understand what i'm trying to tell you here for example we use the uh, sentence we uh, make we use the sentence i'm happy and gay here gay basically uh, is trying to connote a more carefree attitude and the fact that you're more happy and then we uh, make a sentence which says i am gay now if you use the word gay here i am in the sentence i am gay you would realize that the predominant meaning here is to have a sexual connotation to it right so that means a one word can have two separate meanings in different contexts i hope i am able to make you understand this so what they are trying to do you do here is whenever they will ask you a question with regards to what does it mean what does intrepid mean here they are asking you the contextual meaning of that word here so that means you need to read the sentence again in order to understand what does it mean here at least in the in the context that they are asking so what they are saying is thus inventors and innovators have to be intrepid enough to take risk so that means they have to be probably they have to be strong enough or they have to be daring enough uh, you know they have to be gutsy enough to take those risk consider failures as stepping stones and not stumbling blocks some inventions are the result of a keen observation or a simple discovery the inventor of velcro also called the zipples zipless zipper is a swiss engineer george de mistral he was hiking in the woods when he found burrs clinging onto his clothes and his dog's fur back at home he studied the burrs he discovered that each burr was a collection of tiny hooks which made it cling on to the other object a few years later he made and patented these strips of fabric that came to us as velcro the world of inventions and innovations is a competitive one but the race does not end here it is also prevalent in the case of getting intellectual property rights there have been inventors who failed to get a single patent while there have been some who managed to amass numerous patents in their lifetime thomas edison had 1093 pet patents to his credit We relate the telephone with Alexander Graham Bell. It is believed that around the same time Antonio had also designed the telephone but due to lack of resources and various hardships he could not proceed with the patent of his invention. It is also believed that Alicia Gray had made a design for the telephone and applied for the patent at the US Patent Office on the same day as Graham Bell did. By sheer chance Graham's lawyers turned to file the papers came first hence Graham was granted the first patent for the telephone it is not easy and at times almost impossible for an inventor to be an innovator too there are very few like thomas edison who graduated from being an incredible inventor to a successful manufacturer and businessman with brilliant marketing skills while innovations that have help to enhance the quality of life are laudable equally laudable are the inventions that laid the foundation of these very innovations till now what i have done is following the first step i am reading the passage i'm trying to understand the passage the second is i have essentially found the central idea even when i moved ahead and read the second and the third paragraph 
that what they're trying to say is they're trying to differentiate between the two concepts, which is invention and innovation, and that these are not interchangeable, even though we use it interchangeably. And they're basically differentiating it on the basis of the fact that all the inventions, when commercialized, become and are usable by the society, then they turn out and become innovations. However, if you see how if you see the formation of the summary which is a third step i think it is very clear in the first paragraph what they are trying to do is they are trying to talk about the difference between invention and innovation and what is that difference in the second paragraph they are also trying to say that not every invention and innovation is successful and that failure is a part of the journey the third thing that they are trying to talk about is they are trying to give us examples of how many people have actually turned their inventions into something which was useful and they have been able to get patent on it. So they are talking about the importance of patent when you are also inventing. And they are supporting this particular fact with the example of Alexander Graham Bell in which two people had, uh, two people had you know, invented the same thing but because one person was smart enough or daring enough or just by sheer chance that his file was before the other person's file he got an opportunity to get a patent over it right so that means this is my summary this is how they are moving in a this is a chronology of my reading comprehension let's move on to the first question the first question is the text in the passage can be best termed as now before moving on to the question i think it was very clear from the very first paragraph that the tone of the passage did not have any perspective Right, so that means the opinion based approach automatically got eliminated. So that means it was a fact based approach. Now, to decipher whether under fact based approach, whether it is narrative, descriptive, and the other option that I mentioned here, let's try and see. So, there are four options mentioned here narrative, descriptive, persuasive, and expository. Narrative, no, of course, not because it is not a storytelling. Now, talking about the word expository, what do you mean by expository? Expository, basically, the literal meaning of expository is nothing but descriptive. However, there is a little bit of a difference between descriptive and expository passage. Now, what is that difference? So, when I say descriptive, what I'm trying to do is I'm merely trying to describe the particular state of facts. I have no perspective. I have no opinion. I'm not trying to prove anything through that. However, when I talk about a passage which has an expository approach, it basically means that I'm not only trying to describe a certain phenomena, I'm also trying to make a point through that. So, for example, I say, describe Bombay. I will say Bombay is a beautiful city, Bombay is divided into two parts. However, I'm not trying to make any point through that. But when I say expository, what I'm trying to do is I'm not only going to describe Bombay, but I'm also going to try and make a point through my approach, right? So, I hope you're able to understand that in expository, you're also trying to bring out a point through the passage or through describing the fact. Let me give you one more example. So, for example, whenever we buy a new product, you usually see a manual with that. So, now that manual tells you how to use the product. That is a mere description, right? So, that is a descriptive kind of a passage. However, where I'm trying to, and I'm not trying to make any point when I'm trying to tell you that this is how you're supposed to use it. However, whenever I talk about an expository kind of a passage, I'm also trying to prove a point. Remember one thing, expository type of passages have more dimensions vis-a-vis -vis descriptive. I'm also trying to, so for example, when I talk about Bombay and I'm describing Bombay, if suppose I'm trying to prove a point through that, wherein I'm trying to tell you that it is a very, very modern or a very, very forward society or a very, very forward city. So this is a point that I'm trying to prove through my passage. So automatically my pa passage from descriptive becomes an expository, right? So the text in the passage could be best termed here as expository. Why? Because they're not merely trying to tell you that there's a difference between the word innovation and invention, but they're also giving more clarity to the, uh, to the uh, people who are reading, uh, to the viewers, that invention means a certain thing, innovators means a certain thing, and they're further going on and trying to tell you what is what innovation and why innovation is better and why do you think that it should be brought out in the society so they are also trying to make a point by drawing the difference between invention and innovation and that is why the correct answer here should be expository now let's mo move on to the second type of the question the main idea of the author is to so this is where you have to bring in your central theme of the passage they are saying highlight the difficulties faced by innovators 
focus on the hardships of the patent seekers, compare the innovators to inventors and reveal the importance of inventors. According to me, the best answer suited is compare innovators to inventors because in the very first paragraph, they started off by saying that we would want to tell you that the, the word invention and innovation does not mean the same thing. So that was the central theme and according to that, the answer should be C. So it doesn't even take a second for you to gauge what the answer should be if you understand and if you follow the tips that have been dealt before. Looking at this question, the author believes that innovators enhance the utility of inventions. Innovators face fewer challenges than inventors do. Every inventor has a pattern for the invention. Invention is the same as innovation. Sometimes, I will also tell you another method. Sometimes it is very clear from the option that what the answer is going to be. However, sometimes things might not be clear. In that case, you can also start excluding things which are for sure not the probable answers. For example, the author believes that invention is the same as innovation. For sure not because the very first paragraph clarifies that they are trying to draw a difference between the two concepts. So D can never be an answer. However, because we read the paragraph in such a good manner and also we formed a summary, we realized that what are they trying to say is the only way invention can come to the society is when innovators commercially bring out so that bring it out right so that means innovators enhance the utility of inventions for sure why because they actually bring it out to the society and make it in the form of a usable option otherwise if the inventions remain with the invent like with the inventors they will never be brought out in the society so that means the answer here should be a let's move ahead benjamin franklin and steve jobs believe that a there is no place for mistakes in the process of making an innovation Making a mistake before finding success is not unusual. Failure is a permanent stumbling block. All innovators have to go through failures. It's a, If you directly go to the paragraph, if you remember in the first paragraph towards the end, they're talking about, you know, whether it is a stumbling block or whether it is, you know, whether failures are common or not, you will immediately be able to locate the answer right there. And that is why it is so important to form the summary because I don't even have to look at the paragraph to know where it is, where the answer is situated. I exactly know that this was the pattern that was being followed when I was reading the passage and it is somewhere after the end of the first paragraph that I will be able to locate my answer. And if you remember there, they had mentioned that if you make a mistake before finding success, it is not unusual. That usually you are going to come across um you know you're going to make mistakes and the best way is to improve it in the next innovation or improve the next innovation so i think that's where your answer is and the answer should be b here moving ahead velcro can be best described as i don't think i need to answer this you can absolutely now understand what the answer should be however quickly if we understand whether it is a highly planned fruit of failure the need of the hour and accidental invention it is very well mentioned how he actually discovered velcro and when he was going on hiking and I think so the best answer would be an accidental invention because he discovered it when he was going on hiking. So it was an accidental invention because that started sticking to his dog's fur, right? Uh, moving ahead, it is believed that Graham Bell became the first patent holder of the telephone because of first his ingenuity and good fortune, the carelessness of Alicia, Alicia's lawyer, the clever trick played by his lawyer, the biased officials in the patent office. D for sure not, C for sure not because it doesn't mention anything of these th these two uh, thoughts, right? However, if you go back and look at the paragraph, most of you are going to say, uh, look at uh, by mere chance. Uh, sorry, it says by sheer chance. If you see here in towards the end, it says by sheer chance, Graham's lawyer turned to file the papers came first. So, you know, most of you should immediately be able to draw that it has to be his good fortune that actually led him to get the patent over the telephone. So the answer should be A here. Moving ahead, which of the following is untrue? Inventors may not be innovators. Innovators are not expected to be enterprising. To get a patent, the applicant has to follow a legal process. Intellectual property rights are not always easy to get. Now, again, like I told you, where you're not able to immediately get the answer, try excluding the options and then going ahead and picking out the right option. And if you see, you will immediately be able, if you've understood the paragraph, it's a very, very easy answer. It says innovators are not expected to be enterprising. Actually, that is what is the difference between inventors and innovators. 
that innovators are supposed to be enterprising so that's where your answer is and that's exactly the should be the right answer so if you've understood the passage that there's a difference between invention and innovation and what is that difference this question you will not have to go back to the passage to look for it you'll be able to answer it immediately moving ahead which of the following text from the passage clearly indicates failure the world of inventions and innovations is a competitive one definitely not a failure it's a competitive one and doesn't depict any kind of a failure second not every innovation sees the light of the day this could be a failure because it could be a failure to the society it could be a failure to the person who's not able to bring it bring his or her invention to a usable form the third is thus inventors and innovators have to be intrepid enough to take risk now that is not a failure that is the reason why so that a certain invention sees the light of the day the person should be uh, gutsy enough or daring enough so that you know his invention can see the light of the day so this is not a failure this is a reason why somebody should actually be gutsy so that means c is not an option a is not an option d none of the above so the only option that is most appropriate is the b option and hence i think according to me the answer should be b moving ahead which of the four words can replace the word intrepid hasty intellectual daring and rich i think if we have already figured out the contextual meaning of intrepid while we were reading the passage it is going to be a matter of seconds for you to know what is the meaning of the word intrepid that has been used in the context in the reading passage and within a second you'll be able to answer the question that the right answer should be hasty if you remember when we were doing the passage i categorically told you whenever you see a word which you think we normally do not use try and understand the contextual meaning of that word right then and there because that will save you a lot of time while you're attempting the question now if you attempt this question and you take merely 2 seconds to attempt this question imagine how much time would you save in order to attempt other questions where where it might need more time right so um i hope it is very clear here because we have already done the contextual meaning um while we were doing the passage moving on to the last question which of these words is the antonym of laudable now if you remember towards the end of the passage there was the word laudable in which we said that uh, your efforts uh, towards your preparation for some board exam is laudable now what do you think is the meaning of the word laudable when you are using it in this context it means that it has something to do with you know we are very proud of you or it is very praiseworthy so that means we are trying to look at the opposite of what laudable would mean challenging for sure not tiring no praiseworthy would most likely be the synonym for it so that means the only answer that is remaining is disgraceful i hope you have understood this if you have any doubt you can uh, comment and you can ask us and we'll be very happy to help you thank you so much